Uh, the reason I decided to join today is uh, Ralph, I have a friend, Ralph Moyer, who's been involved in molten salt longer than I have. We met about 15, 20 years ago. Uh, he said I should come to this and I need to present. I've been silent for too long on this and this is something that I should share with my experience and what I've learned over the 20 years I've been involved in molten salt. And what was your main topic of presenting today? My main topic of uh, presentation was, um, uh, I call it the Bonbon Road to Fast Molten Salt Reactors. A Bonbon is a chocolate candy uh, where there's a liquid filling inside it, usually rum. I don't want to make that, I want to make graphite uh, instead of chocolate and instead of rum I want to put something called thorium tetrafluoride. We stack these and this is how we build a nuclear reactor. It's, a, it's the very same way we built the nu our first nuclear reactor in 1940s. Uh, uh, it was a stack of graphite blocks it was a few miles from here in Chicago, and that was called Chicago Pile One. I want to basically go back to the future, recreate that, except instead use molten salt as a right, fuel. That's good. I know you're not going to kill yourself. No. Okay. How uh, about we go, go to the water? water? If you want to join us, you can. I'm, I'll probably ask you to get out of frame once we sit down, but I don't mind you listening but, in and stuff. Please but. continue what you were saying. I'm sorry? Uh, you, you were okay, saying... Uh, I gotta any, get you out of the frame, okay? <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyways, the, uh, the way we created the first reactor, we stacked a bunch of graphite blocks. I want to stack the same graphite blocks, except instead of having the fuel inside the blocks, I want what's called a fertile material of thorium tetrafluoride. Now, this is a, a more solid type of reactor design as opposed to the more, I guess we could say, popular in the thorium conference, liquid fluoride design. Well, the liquid fluoride flows around the blocks and it's the fuel. So the, the fuel is still liquid. Ah, excellent. And then the block provides the shielding and protects the outside from the radiation and the damage. And it also makes uh, Fissile U-233 so we can have a self-sustaining uh, cycle because if we want this to last for the thousand or three thousand years of thorium we have, we have to have a mechanism to take the thorium and convert it into something useful, which is the fissile. And this, this is what this bonbon does. It shields and it makes new fertile, uh, fissile material. And this is, okay, uh, hold on. Single Let's fluid design. stop. Let's move over there, okay? Yes. We got it. We got to actually set up here. Right. We gotta this is down. a single fluid design. Uh, yes, uh, well, it's a single fluid because in the bonbon, it's solid. The thorium tetrafluoride melts at 1,110 degrees centigrade. That's higher than the melting point of copper or silver. So inside this reactor, it would be a solid inside the solid graphite block. The liquid is the fuel salt. And, in, and again, in Chicago Pile, they had air around these blocks for coolant. Uh, here we have the salt is the coolant and it's the fuel, so it is a liquid fuel. And if we create a space cavity in the middle, then we can have a uh, homogeneous core. We can have a fast nuclear reactor and we can burn plutonium very efficiently and destroy it. And this thing can be then fueled with spent fuel and we have 70,000 tons of spent fuel. This is enough for almost a gig 100 gigawatts of installed capacity here in the United States using a waste so, and eliminating the Yucca Mountain problem. So let's cut to the chase immediately. What you're trying to get at here is you're saying we could use this new reactor design to burn our current nuclear waste. Correct. It would solve no, Burn it. Waste use it. It basically stores it and you're, while you're storing it, it's producing a lot of heat, gigawatts of heat. This is a billion watts of heat it can produce. And that heat then can drive steam turbines and make electricity. Meanwhile, instead of it sitting in fuel casks or buried in a mountain, it's producing a useful high temperature heat. So that's the best of both worlds. We get to burn in all of our waste and generate electricity from it Correct. in a clean way. Correct. It's like, what's not to love about it? And it's made by graphite blocks that are stacked inside a, has a metal called Hastaloy container. It's really a simple, it's just like the first reactor we built. Chicago pile, pile of graphite blocks. We're going back to what they did in the 40s. This is really, we're substituting some of the items, but we're going back to the future. This is going back 60, 70 years ago. So this, this is basically very proven technology from the history of 
in a way, graphite has long been used as a nuclear material. It's tough, durable stuff. The fluoride, fluorides have been used against graphite in the Hall Hero cell, which is how we make aluminum. And this has been in this industrial operating since 1889. So this is over 100 years of industrial operation with fluoride salts with graphite. They're completely inert to one another. What would be your thoughts to somebody who says, you know, I don't like nuclear, I'm afraid of it, it's very dangerous, uh, there's a lot of waste, what, what would we say? Almost all our fears are due to ignorance. Um, it, it, most of the people who will say this, it's because they don't know it. And even among the in nuclear community, this is not a mainstream reactor. This project was canceled in 1972 because the country thought the liquid metal fast breeder reactor was going to be the future. We've now done three of them. Two have had unintentional core melts. The last one happened in 1972, where the plant manager had to call the mayor of Detroit and say, prepare to evacuate Detroit. Now, who wants to have that sort of reactor near them? The French recently killed their uh, Super Phoenix. It was a commercial size liquid metal reactor, over a gigawatts of electric power. It operated for 20 years. During that 20 years, it produced only 6% of its total design power. So it didn't produce 100% power, 6%. So you bought 100, you got six. The French closed it. They said it was successful, but they have terminated their pro project. It is not a successful design. These, in, in Russia, they built them. Heat, they would put five heat exchangers around this reactor and they would, they would have a fifth one. Four were only needed to operate. The fifth one was because they expected a fire in their heat exchanger, and they, so they would always have a spare available. This was what our country banked on in 72. It turned out to be a bad investment. The molten salt reactor was killed. In my opinion, had we not killed the molten salt reactor, it would be the dominant reactor in the world. We would shut down coal plants because it's cheaper than coal. Uh, once you have it developed, we wouldn't be having this problem with global warming. It wouldn't even be an issue because the issue would be, well, let's build a few more molten salt reactors and completely shut off our fossil fuel for burning electricity. And if we go to a higher temperature regime, oh yeah, we can make hydrogen with thermochemical uh, uh, water dissociation. So if molten salt reactors are so terrific, why did we uh, cancel that program? There's, there's a couple reasons. I mean, it. Um, let's let's shoot different. Okay. Okay. Let's do a weight balance. Sorry, this is this is all good. We can still use it, but let's let's make sure the cameras are set up for the this this color. Or the uh, first nuclear error on page 99 to 200, he says that the reason the molten salt reactor was killed was because the Republican Party selected the liquid metal fast breeder reactor. N Richard Nixon was the president, and they. Alvin Weinberg, who was the director of Oak Ridge for 18 years, kept pushing molten salt. He was fired in 1972. And uh, I learned, I was in the military and special forces, and we learned if you want to stop a revolution, the way you stop a revolution is you shoot the leader. That's what they did. They shot, they fired Weinberg, and he was a Manhattan scientist. First textbook on nuclear energy was co-written by him. The first patent on a nuclear reactor uh, the light water reactor, which is the mainstay of our nuclear reactor fleet, was done by Alvin Weinberg. Uh, he, he's a co-patent holder on the first patent. So this was no, you know, average guy. This was a man of extreme accomplishment. So when he gets fired, what happened? Nothing. The last look at uh, molten salt reactors by Department of Energy was in uh, the end of the Carter administration. They put a little bit of funding into its non-proliferation that is stopping the spread of nuclear weapons. There was a small study done there. That was their last thing. It was published in 1980. For all that time it went, and only recently, probably in the last uh, couple years, Oak Ridge, the birthplace of the molten salt reactor, where they built two of these things and operated them successfully, um, they've now finally started to relook at molten salt reactors. Unfortunately, they're cool molten salt cooled reactors, not fueled reactors, which is a bit more what I'd like to see happen. Okay, let's uh, relocate over here, okay? Okay, so uh, let's see, what were we talking about? We were talking about... Uh, uh, the, uh, 
how the uh, uh, Republicans favored uh, the uh, liquid metal fast reactor. This is in Weinberg's book, uh, his memoir book, uh, in uh, p on pages 198 to 200, Alvin of uh, his uh, uh, memoir book, the uh, first nuclear error. Uh, he published it in I think it was 90, uh, 1994. Uh, he was about 85 years old then, and so he wanted to set the story straight and he talked about his firing. Now the interesting thing I found was a lot of his closest friends had no idea he was fired. From their experience, knowing him then, he left and they weren't certain why. Um, in the book he said how he was fired because he continued to back the molten salt reactor uh, over the light, liquid metal fast reactor, which is what we had put most of our research investment into. Turns out this is not a very good reactor uh, by 72, uh, two of the three liquid metal fast reactors had suffered core melts, and this is before Three Mile Island. Uh, so 66% failure rate, not a good thing. And the last one, the uh, plant manager had to call the mayor of Detroit and say, prepare to evacuate Detroit. That was Fermi in 72. Well, Alvin Weinberg is focusing and advocating a completely different direction, the molten salt direction. It's a shadow of the budget of the liquid metal uh, program and in his book he says the Republican Party backed the uh, liquid metal fast reactor. My belief is that it was GE who has always backed the liquid metal fast reactor uh, to make uh, fissile fuel to refuel light water reactors. You see it's the razor blade model. Money is made uh, not by selling the reactor. In fact, GE was rumored to sell their light, liquid, uh, light water reactors for cost. But it's like the razor blade. You know those really nice handles they sell you? You wonder why? This is so cheap and it's such a nice handle. Well, then you go and buy the blades and the blades are really expensive. That's the razor blade economic model. They make money off the blades, not the handle. Okay, I sell you a nuclear reactor, a light water reactor. Are you going to buy it at Wal the nuclear fuel from Walmart, Costco? No. You have to buy it from the vendor. And this is highly machined, regulated stuff. Not anybody can get into the business. It's high value stuff. So they sell it, they sell it dear and they make a high profit. The reason it works out is you're getting 2.8 million times more energy from the fission of an equal mass than you would if you burn coal. So even though they're selling to this to you dear, you're getting so much energy out of it, it pays for itself. And the nuclear fuel cost, even at these outrageous prices for fuel, is cheap. The problem with the cycle is it does, we don't have enough fissile, or at least they thought that back in the day, and this is the uranium-235. Well, you need something to make fresh fissile. Well, this is where the liquid metal fast reactor does. It makes plutonium. So the idea was you take the plutonium out of the liquid metal fast reactor, put it in uranium, you'd make, this is called MOX fuel. It has proliferation issues, but hey, that's part of the, the deal with the devil we're making. Then you would sell this fuel to the light water reactors. They would burn it up. The liquid metal reactor makes more fissile fuel. You have this economic cycle. You're making new fuel. You're selling it to this guy. So you're making electricity. This is what GE wanted to do. It's the razor blade model. The molten salt reactor busts that thing. The fuel is liquid. Any reasonable chemist can make this fuel as long as he has access to the thorium and the uranium that has to go in it. Once you go in it, there's no fabrication. It's a liquid. So you've already ruined the economics of the nuclear fuel being your, your revenue source. This was a disruptive technology. It's kind of, I, I always liken the molten salt reactor to a, the transistor. I'm old enough to remember when we bought a TV or a radio, it had vacuum tubes in it. So the electronics maker made money off selling you the TV or radio. But inside there were all these little glowing vacuum tubes. They burned out, they had filaments. You'd pull them out. Well, you just couldn't put any old vacuum tube on. You had to get the right model. Who made the vacuum tube? The guys who made the TV. So you had this predictable cycle, this re additional revenue stream, annuity stream of popping in new vacuum tubes. So you sold the TV and you continued to make money off vacuum tubes. So why didn't the Americans who invented the transistor then put these va uh, tra transistors into the TVs? It destroys your economic model. What sort of fool would do that? 
So who did conver commercialize the uh, transistor? I, I'm probably going to mispronounce his name, but I think it said Akito Morita. We know him as the chairman of the Sony Corporation. He made he was part of the effort that made the first transistor radio. It had to be someone who didn't, whose rice bowl, whose vested interest wasn't busted. This is why I don't think molten salt reactors will ever be built in America, because we have too many vested interests who are, they like the nuclear industry right now. We have 100 operating reactors. People think it's dead. It, they have to be refueled every year. New fuel, that's money. Where you were, I just want to get you to launch over with a new introduction now that we have a, the, the shot. Yeah, I'm sorry. What, I, Could I, I get you to introduce yourself again from oh, the top? Sure. Uh, My name's Bruce Hoagland. Uh, I've been involved with uh, molten salt reactors for about 20 years now. I was introduced to molten salt by Dr. Yuri Gad of Oak Ridge. And uh, could you just summarize what your talk was about again? I know uh, we're rehashing, but... The, the, the talk's title was uh, called The Bon Bon Road to Fast Reactors. A bon Bon is a chocolate candy with inside it, they've somehow put liquid rum, usually liquid rum, inside. I don't want to do, of course, the chocolate candy. I want to do a graphite container. And inside, instead of the rum, I want to put a substance called thorium tetrafluoride. Uh, this is the fluorinated form of thorium. Very, it's very easy to make. You put it in there, you stack these bonbons, and you basically create a reactor with these stacked bonbons, which sounds fantastical, but a few miles from here, the fir world's first nuclear reactor was built called Chicago Pile 1. Why was it called a pile? It was a pile of graphite blocks with instead of thorium tetrafluoride in it, they had uranium in it. They stacked it up, that was the reactor. It's that simple. You take graphite, you put uranium in it, you stack it, you make a reactor. That's how the first reactor was built. And that was called Chicago Pile 1. I want to do it slightly differently with the bonbons. The, the thorium is inside, and instead of air going around it like the Chicago Pile had, I want to have a substance called molten salt. Inside this molten salt, we have a nuclear fuel. This is where the heat and nuclear fission will be generated, but it's also the coolant. And the bond bond is there just to maintain structural integrity of the reactor and to shield the uh, outer metal walls from the radiation that's produced by the reactor and keep everything safe on the outside. So, and the bond bonds then provide basically a structural radiation thing. The energy is generated in the molten salt. What do you think is the best way to tell people about this technology you're working on? There's an education part because this is unknown even to most nuclear people because only two reactors of this kind were built and operated in Oak Ridge. The first one in 1954 and the second one in the late 60s. Very, they operated very successful but they were radically different than our current reactors. I, I studied nuclear and uh, uh, physics when I was in college. We weren't taught this reactor at all. It wasn't mainstream, it was considered a sideshow. Um, it's, so most nuclear people don't even know of this reactor. So there's a, a huge education that has to be done uh, about this reactor because it's virtually unknown. Uh, the second thing is there's a lot of forces that don't want this reactor because it's a disruptive technology. Um, I personally don't think it's going to be built first in the United States. We, oh, I take that back. It was built first twice in the United States. The third commercial one will not be built in the United States because it's unknown and we have too many forces that don't want it being built. Could I, could I get you to make that point from scratch? Make that point from scratch where you say um, the first two were built in the United States. I don't think the third will be built in the United States. You just said the third commercial one and it yeah. sounds like the first two were commercial. The United States built the first two uh, prototype MSRs. They operate fine. The third one will not be built in the United States because there's a lot of people who don't want it built. Uh, a lot of economic interests don't want it built. It's a disruptive technology. I think the first uh, molten salt reactor will be built in a place like Norway, Korea, maybe India, but most likely China. Now, a lot of people are against it, a Chinese building it. This is American technology. They're stealing our idea. Well, look, we're too stupid to build the, uh, the thing. It's a lick on us. The Chinese need this. They're, I visited China in 2000. My son and I got sick 
after three days we got bronchitis. Our tour guide was so sick, the air was so filthy. She, we, she couldn't walk us up to the Great Wall. She had to stay back in the van. And uh, my son and I went up and my wife, again, we weren't feeling well because the air was filthy. This is in 2000. From what I see, the air has become maybe twice as bad. I just, I can't picture it. They need a technology that isn't burning coal. And the only one I know of is nuclear. And I know a lot of people don't want to hear that, but that's the only other power source that goes 24 seven and not affected by weather or geography or anything else. So the Chinese need this. And the only thing they're gonna really do is nuclear. So which nuclear do they do? Light water reactors like we do? They're not bad, but there's an even better solution. And it's a molten salt reactor that we cast off that the Chinese now reportedly have about 400 people working on. I say more power to them because I actually think that's how America will get back in the game. For all our irrational reasons, we just can't do something rationally because it's a good idea. Oh no, it has to be because of a threat or a competition. So we had a arms race, we had a space race. I'm hoping the Chinese build this and the, the American public goes, oh my God, they've stolen our idea, our idea. We've got to beat them at it. We love a competition. So let's have a molten salt race. It's not the best way to do it, but if it gets us in the game, I'm happy. And we've done stupider things, more expensive things. This would be uh, the best competition China and America could, could have. May the best power win. There will be no losers in this game, only winners. Well, I'd like to cover what you think people's misconceptions are about energy and nuclear power, radiation. I was just asked why uh, nuclear was, uh, you know, it, what its perception in uh, the United States is. Okay, and let so, me... Exactly, sorry, you're, you're, doing it, you're doing it great, and I'll ask you to look at this top one. Oh, the top one now? Okay. Um, the, uh, I, I've been asked why, uh, what, is, what is the American perception or attitude towards nuclear power? And if I could just tell my per, little personal story here, I was originally a nuclear physics major. I ended up leaving the major because I became opposed to nuclear power. The reason I became opposed to nuclear power is our current nuclear has a huge waste stream. It's still, it, the, uh, the, the audio. Oh. It's okay, not your fault. And I'd like to just digress for a moment and tell you about my little story of, of my personal thing. I was originally a nuclear physics major in college, and as I learned about nuclear power, I actually became opposed to it. And the reason I became opposed to it is our current nuclear has a huge waste stream. And I was appalled by it. Um, nuclear power gives 2.8 million times more than burning the equivalent of mass of coal. This is why nuclear power will not be ignored by humans. It's just too big a payoff for us to abandon. Um, however, our current nuclear uh, energy only uses 1% of that energy. So we're only getting 28,000 times more than coal, which is why nuclear power is still a good thing to do. But we do have this huge waste stream. And as I started learning, I, what happened was, even though I left nuclear energy officially, I continued studying nuclear power and I came across thorium. And this is in the uh, late 70s, early 80s. And I started studying thorium and for whatever reason, it, it became of interest to me. And I was uh, researching it and then I finally came across a person who taught me about molten salt reactors. His name was Yuri Gat of Oak Ridge, and this was about 20 years ago. And that reignited my passion in nuclear because to me it solves the waste problem. Getting back to the American public and how they view it, uh, most of the fear, fear is generally based on ignorance. Um, Americans score, and sadly, at the bottom, uh, near the bottom of math and science. We don't have a scientific basis. This is a science, this is a technology. Um, you have to have a certain understanding so you can get rid of the fear and people aren't willing to take the time to learn. They don't understand radiation. They don't know right now I'm being irradiated. About half of it's coming from the sky because space is radioactive. This substance I'm standing on is radioactive. This church behind me made out of stone is probably radioactive stone. Um, and I had uh, fruit for this morning. There's radioactive potassium in there. My body needs it, but it's radioactive. I'm getting a dose internally from the fruit I ate, which I need. 
so the bottom line is we're getting radiation, but the public doesn't understand it. And radiation is a magnitude issue. A drop of water doesn't kill you, but a tsunami probably will. It's magnitude. A little bit of radiation, I, if it is, is it harmful? I don't think so. If it is, there's not much we can do about it. We're getting it. Matter of fact, I love to asking people about radiation. Here's a test question. Who gets more radiation? A nuclear bomber pilot or a nuclear submarine commander with the reactor right next to him? Well, the answer is the bomber pilot. Why? Space is radioactive. He's getting irradiated by space being so high above the Earth's atmosphere. It surprises most people because they don't think that's the way things work. They would think the reactor would surely be irradiating the crew, and in fact, they're not. We know how to shield reactors, and we know, we know pretty much how to contain them. It's a, it's a safe technology, but it's misunderstood. Um, so how do we change that? I think most people are, they, they realize we've got to do something different. We can't, business cannot go on as it is. So the thing is to say, look, there is a problem. We have a solution. And I think we even have a better solution. Light water reactors, the boiling water reactors, the pressurized water reactors, they're not a bad energy source, and I wouldn't mind it near me. Matter of fact, I live in D.C. area. There's a nuclear reactor not far from me called uh, at Lake Anna. It's sitting there. 40% of my electricity is coming from nuclear. The way it just gets rid of its heat was it dumps the heat into a lake. There's no cooling tower. The man-made lake dumps the heat into the cooling tower. Well, they built homes around this lake because people like to be near water. Then Three Mile Island happened, and the real estate prices plunge because right oh my god you're near the radioactive lake with the radioactive reactor right there so people sold their places well the smart one bought it right now I don't know what the price is but it's gone up by like a factor of 10 or 20 from that time period and you know which houses sell for the most the one closest to the discharge point why the water's warm you can swim in december with nuclear heated water which is a waste byproduct of making my 40 percent electricity from nuclear so this is a good thing but we could do even better and we have done better we need to do better because we need to repower the whole world not just this country 20 percent of our nuclear comes from excuse me 20 percent of our electricity comes from nuclear we really need to go more like France, 80%. And the developing world, especially China, especially China, needs to do it even more than we do. So we, we, you go on to people, hey, we need to change. Do you really understand nuclear? For example, nuclear waste. People freak about nuclear waste. You ask them what it is and they go, it's, and there's a pause. They don't know. They have, it's dangerous. But it's made out of stuff. What kind of stuff is it? How long does it last? What is its dangers? You know, it, it, they don't know any of these things. Nuclear waste, to me, is a resource that hasn't been utilized. And I have an analogy with uh, natural gas. When they, they, we first started drilling for oil, the oil driller's nightmare was to hit natural gas. Why? It was pressure. Their flimsy little equipment would explode. All right, blow it out with pressure, then when it came into the air, it would often ignite, there'd be a fireball. The, the oil drillers hated finding natural gas with their oil. It was their nightmare. What are we drilling for now? We can't find enough natural gas. So what happened from natural gas being a dangerous waste to a resource? It's infrastructure. We put in pipelines that go to my house, many people's houses. I use it for cooking. I use it for my uh, heating and my hot water heating. It's a resource only because of infrastructure. Same thing with spent fuel. There's 2% of spent fuel is a fuel. It's a fuel sitting there in, in a form that if we extract it, we can use it in a molten salt reactor. This, we can fuel our molten salt reactor. So we can take a waste, we turn it into a resource with the addition of an infrastructure called a molten salt reactor. And now we have a carbon free energy source that can't melt down because it's already melted down. You said a uh, submarine uh, operator versus a nuclear bomber, I think is what you said. And I think we might as well just have an airline pilot and not make the plane a weapons plane. That way they're oh, okay. not... All right. I, you know, I, I, I always like asking people a question to uh, test their radiation knowledge is, who gets more radiation? 
a airline pilot or a nuclear submarine commander. And most people, of course, choose the nuclear submarine commander. Why? That reactor is right next to them. Well, the reality is the reactor is well shielded. The radiation stays within the reactor and its containment and its shielding. So the, the crew and the, uh, the captain, they're getting hardly any radiation. Um, and because they're underwater, they're not getting radiation from space because space is where we get much of our radiation. So the pilot is actually getting much more radiation than the, the crew or captain of the nuclear submarine. So when you fly, that is probably where you're going to get the most radiation in your entire year. Is it dangerous? No, I don't think so. We do it all the time. There's nothing you can do about it. But it's a very tiny amount, and this brings up the problem of magnitude. Radiation is a magnitude problem, and people have a hard time understanding magnitude. They don't know a part per billion is one billionth of stuff, or a part per million and a part per thousand. There's a million times difference between those. To them, it's like, oh, geez, numbers I don't know. And that's what radiation is. I mean, I'm getting, I think, point two sieverts per hour. I, I mean, really, I have a hard time understanding that. So how, and I've studied this stuff. So how do people understand 0.2 sieverts? Is a sievert bad? I mean, you, it, you don't know these answers. So people have this fear of radiation because they don't understand it. The fact of the matter is, even in accidents, even around Chernobyl, Chernobyl area, there are people living there now, they're not supposed to be, but they are. The radiation they're receiving is about equivalent to what people in Denver receive. Why Denver? Denver's high, it gets more radiation from space, its soil has more uranium and thorium in it, they get more radiation from the radon coming out of the ground and into their basement. So they get more radiation than we are here in Chicago, but they get about the same amount as a person living in Chernobyl does which again, people think, well, isn't that a wasteland? And no, it's actually pretty green and not too bad looking because there's no humans or very few hum humans there to disrupt the ecology. Can you make an observation about oh, uh, people in Denver not dropping dead? I, I lived in Colorado Springs, which is even higher than uh, Denver, so I was getting even more radiation. It turns out the cancer rate, and I can't remember the exact numbers, the cancer rate of a Denver person is less than a, a typical American. Now, is this due because he's getting radiation, it's protecting him, it's killing the cancer? No, it's not enough radiation to really affect cancer one way or the other, is my attitude. We get our cancer from uh, a lot of human sources, like smoking, eating uh, maybe fried foods, there's chemicals that that creates. This is, and you know, pollution that from our cars. We're getting more radiation from coal, uh, there's arsenic in coal that's being blown into the air. This is where we're getting our, our cancers, not from uh, uh, radiation that's a background radiation. So Denver people have lower incidence of smoking. They're healthier. They're more active. They even think altitude has a health benefit. This is why Denver people are healthier on average than an American. The radiation is just noise. It doesn't matter. It's kind of like a puff of breeze, does it affect you? Yeah, it may muss your hair if you have hair, but it's not gonna affect your life. Same thing with the ra background radiation, low levels of radiation, they're not gonna hurt you anything. I'm far more worried being fair-skinned about skin cancer from the sun than I am about radiation cancers from any other source. That's, that's a danger to me, skin cancer caused by the sun, not radiation, man-made or otherwise opinion on the Oak Ridge National Lab molten salt efforts, like the current effort to... Do you want the past effort where they used to throw it away and Yuri Gat tried stopping them and they, sure. they prevented them? Yeah, you can recount that, sure. Um, to, to show you how uh, almost anti-molten uh, salt Oak Ridge became during the 80s and uh, uh, 90s, they, um, uh, Yuri, the, my friend Yuri Gat from Oak Ridge, uh, Dr. Yuri Gat, he uh, introduced me to molten salt 20 years ago. Uh, he would go around the lab trying to pre preserve the molten salt artifacts. They would, uh, for example, uh, Oak Ridge made a lot of these salt loops. It's where basically little circular loops of plumbing pipe where they would circulate this hot molten salt to see did it corrode the piping. Because you have to know that if you're going to build a reactor out of molten salt. 
and they would test how much corrosion was done and they would run these things for a thousand hours, 10,000 hours, sometimes even 20 and more thousand hours of operation, again to see was there corrosion in this thing. And these are very high temperatures. This was about 700 degrees centigrade, which is about 1,300 degrees Fahrenheit approximately. So these are red hot loops they're running. So they, they were valuable artifacts of the molten salt age. Well, Oak Ridge was throwing them away. And Yuri Gat was like, no, no, we need these for history for if, if and when we restart this, this thing. Well, they wouldn't tell him. This one time, uh, Yuri was giving me a tour of what's called the graphite reactor. That was the, se uh, the first plutonium production reactor we uh, built. It was, I talked earlier about the Chicago Pile 1. This was a, basically a Chicago Pile 2. It was a pile of graphite blocks with tubes. This is how we made our early military plutonium during World War II. He was giving me a tour of that, but as we were coming into this big warehouse type facility that the reactor was in, the, uh, there was this pallet covered with these books. And these are thick books, spiral bound, and they're just jumbled all over this pallet. And I walked up and I stopped, I'm looking down at the pallet, and Yuri says, what's that? He goes, oh, they never tell me anymore when they're throwing this stuff away. And I just reached down and picked up two of these big thick books. And at that time, the workman came in who was gonna cart it away. And Yuri asked, what are you gonna do with this, these books? And the guy says, burn them. They were burning all the technical documents because they were taking one or two of each, storing them in a facility called the Central Facility. This was a library, not open to the public or the average researcher. We'll have, to, we'll have to back right up to uh, you or your friend seeing the pallets. What's your name? I'm Gordon. Gordon? Oh, you're Gordon McDonald? Yeah. I see your name, but... Yeah. yeah. I, I saw you at Teak 3. I didn't speak to you, really. I probably when just... When did you see me? Teak 3. You were at Teak 3, but... That was I in just record. Yes. Yeah, that's where I live, so... Yeah, I mean, that's the first time I saw you, but I don't think I've really had a discussion with you ever. <laughs> Anyways, Yuri, uh, Yuri Gad is giving me a tour of the uh, graphite reactor and we stumble across this pallet covered with these manuals. And these are big, thick manuals, spiral bound. And I stop and look at it and Yuri, who was ahead of me, stopped, turned around and he went, oh, they never tell me anymore when they do this and throw them away. About that time, the workman comes. <laughs> They need to have more fireproof stuff here. <laughs> My friend Yuri Gat of Oak Ridge was giving me a tour of the graphite reactor. And this is a, uh, our large reactor we made at the Chicago pile. And its purpose was to produce the initial amounts of plutonium for the uh, war effort. This was, again, uh, built during uh, the early stages of World War II. He's, Yuri's a little bit ahead of me. And I stop and I look at this pallet that's covered with these big, thick books. And they're this thick and they're spiral bound. And I stop and I look at them. I see some of the titles. And Yuri then sees what I'm looking at. He goes, oh, they don't tell me about this anymore. At that time, the worker walks up and says, hey, what are you doing here? Yuri identifies himself and asks, hey, what are you going to do with these books? And the guy goes, well, we're going to burn them. Uh, and Yuri goes, you know, you can't. I go, well, I'll take them. And the guy says, I can't give them to you. You can have the two in your hand, but the rest have to be burned. What Oak Ridge was doing was taking all the technical manuals. They took up space, but they were burning them and they were taking about one or two of each. They were putting it in this library called the Central Facility. And this Central Facility, again, was in a secure installation called Oak Ridge. The average person and researcher couldn't go in and see it, let alone did they even know it existed. So this was a, basically a secure library to lock up the molten salt books. These things stayed locked up until uh, NASA was looking at a space reactor and they needed a high temperature reactor that um, didn't operate any pressure. Well, there's very few reactors like this. The molten salt is one of them. So they started looking at the molten salt reactor for a space-based power source to power uh, rocket probes going out into deep space because the sol sun panels don't, uh, solar panels don't work out there. There's not enough sun and you need too many of them. So they're looking at this, so they, they get a request to Oak Ridge. Oak Ridge digitizes all these 
um, these documents. Well, there's a young engineer at NASA, his name's Kirk Sorensen. Kirk has the wherewithal, he looks at it, he goes, fluid fuel reactors, really? He knows nothing about it, most of us. I didn't know anything about it, and I was a nuke major. Kirk, I think, was a mechanical engineer. He starts reading it, he sees this is amazing stuff, and this is no little thing. There's hundreds of these big, thick documents. This was a long research project starting from the 50s, finally terminated in 1980. A huge body of research Oak Ridge did, unfortunately only Oak Ridge, so it's geographically limited knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> this is, uh, just so you know, this is going really well. So I'm is happy it? to keep doing this for uh, Oh, okay, all right. The enormity of the body of work. Oh, the, uh, anyways, Oak Ridge uh, did a huge body of work, and unfortunately, they own, they're the only ones who really did molten salt research. For talk, talk about the time frame, like this was going back from this year. Oh, oh, oh I see. Yeah, um, uh, Oak Ridge did this huge body of work. First of all, they were early interested in fluid fuel reactors, and these were you can dissolve nuclear salts in water, and that can make a reactor. In fact, this was the main reactor of universities. It was called a water boiler reactor. It was self-controlling, and they deemed it safe enough because a student or Homer Simpson couldn't screw this reactor up. So Oak Ridge in investigated all these fluid fuel reactors, but one of the ones, and the more interesting one, I think, was the molten salt reactor. Unfortunately, Oak Ridge is about the only place that did do it, so you had this geographically isolated place with a huge body of molt concentrated molten salt knowledge that never got out, even though they produced this huge body of work, hundreds of these well-written, thick, technically rich diagrams, uh, uh, excuse me, documents with diagrams, amazing diagrams, Oak Ridge left no technical stone unturned. I, I don't think I've ever thought of a molten salt idea that Oak Ridge didn't think of earlier. And this spanned from the 50s all the way up uh, when it was finally totally terminated in 1980. So this is a huge body of research. Kirk Sorensen saw the value. He saw he had just hit the mother load. And being a younger guy, internet savvy, he produced a bunch of CDs. He gave me some of those. Uh, then he put it on the web. And one of the problems I had prior to this, this was about early 2000s. I can't remember the exact time frame. Prior to that, I would talk about molten salt and I'd say, oh yeah, it's a meltdown proof reactor and it can use thorium and it can, it has enough, we have enough thorium and uranium to last a thousand to three thousand years and it can repower everything. I sound like a nut. No one knows about this. So where's my documentation? Well, I have these two thick books, but if I'm doing this over the internet or email, I can't, you know, show you this book. Well, once they're digitized, I can. Now, when Kirk put it on the web, it made it real. So people like me could say, well, read this document. And the person would download the PDF and go, oh my God, this is, you know, 300 pages of technical documentation of this aspect of molten salt reactor design. Why were they able to do that? They built and operated two of these things. First one in 1954, and the second one was the more commercial prototype in uh, mid-1960s to late 1960s uh, it operated. It, it was a hugely successful test and they thought they would go on. Unfortunately, Weinberg was fired in 72 and the program was essentially terminated. Can you describe the physicality of the documents? Like, I don't like Richard Martin, I don't have him talking about his experience. Uh, I wish I had brought it with me. The documents. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. Uh, like, he said a lot of this stuff was locked up in a filing cabinet. Can you uh, articulate any of the remoteness of, as you're saying, it's like geographically located. Could you describe the physical environment that oh, some oh, of this I, stuff... I did the first time, the, uh, the uh, CF combined facility, which is the secure... Uh, Again, when uh, Oak Ridge was burning all the uh, uh, technical documents related to the molten salt reactor, they kept one or two of each copy, and they put it into this thing called the central facility. The central facility was a secure library where these documents were stored. Average person or researcher would not ever see these documents. Again, they were 
They were in Oak Ridge where you just couldn't wander in because it's a nuclear facility. And then it's within Oak Ridge is this other secure thing called the central facility. So essentially they locked away these technical documents. And these, this was a massive amount. Again, they were, a lot of them are this thick. Again, massive technical document. So they filled up many rows of bookshelves or, uh, I don't know, filing cabinets. I never went into the uh, central facility. I never had authorization to do so, but I had those two I had taken off the pallet and they turned out to be two of the best ones I could. One was the status report of the molten salt breeder reactor and it was published in 1972. And this told not only what they had done and learned, but their prototype, which was gonna be a breeder reactor, which was gonna compete against the liquid metal fast breeder reactor, which was the, the Republicans and the nation's favored reactor. This was gonna be their one that they were gonna compete against it. They never were allowed to compete. The molten salt breeder reactor was never built. Uh, again, they fired Weinberg to terminate that program and they cut the funding. Could you, um we lost one camera, but I'm good to keep going here if you are. Could you talk about the IFR? I know you talked about it already. I don't like it. Okay. Um. I mean, I, I, I'll talk about it. I, if you want negative stuff, I'm full yeah, of negative just, stuff. Just be honest. What's oh. good and what's bad right. about the IFR? Okay. Um, the, the United States, uh, I've talked a little bit about the liquid metal fast reactor. Most people don't understand it. This is a, uh, a thin metal tube about the diameter of a pencil. Uh, the nuclear fuel is inside and it has a very thin sheathing. Again, this is a lot like a light water reactor, except they circulate sodium as the coolant around this, uh, this fuel pin where the heat is generated instead of water. Sodium is a very good heat transfer medium and it removes the heat very efficiently. The bad thing about liquid sodium is it's chemically very reactive. Uh, sodium burns in air, uh, it, bur it burns in water, and when it burns in water, or if it burns in air with water, it produces sodium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide is lye. Lye is the active ingredient in Drano. So you have this burning hot fire, and the ash or off gas is, is vaporized Drano. You can start to see a problem, but it gets worse because as the sodium goes through the core, it gets irradiated with the neutrons. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that, that's going good. I know you, you did speak you, on this already. You, you, you picked a high fire day. Um, the IFR is a, uh, a liquid metal fast reactor. It's uh, the only surviving one, the other, uh, we made three of them. Two had unintentional core melts. Uh, uh, the last one was in 72 when um, uh, the plant manager, this was outside of Detroit, uh, the Fermi plant, the uh, 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 plant manager had to call the mayor of Detroit and say, prepare to evacuate Detroit. Their reactor was running out of control and it was melting down. Was that what they talked about in Pandora's Promise? Because they were talking about a reactor that could not melt down. Well, they, they, I, I got a little irritated with that movie because they said this reactor can't melt down. Well, you have two siblings and they had core melts. Why can't you melt? And that was completely a, I, I want to be blunt, it's a lie. They can melt, they have, um, they can produce enough heat to melt their core. And there's a problem with their fuel. They have a metal fuel, which is a... Do you want to walk around the block with this? I don't, I don't want to make you guys carry stuff unnecessarily, but I figure we could do a whole circuit okay. and come back to it. Okay, thanks. Yeah. They, um, the, the core of the uh, EBR2, the IFR, can melt. And when people say it can't, in my opinion, they're completely wrong. The, uh, the fuel inside it is a metal, which is a uh, little bit unusual for these liquid metal reactors. They usually have an oxide fuel. This is a metal fuel. Uh, the problem is when they get to a certain temperature, uh, this fuel is mainly uranium, and uranium forms what we call in uh, uh, material science a eutectic, a low melting point eutectic, where uranium will bond, will mix with the iron of the sheathing, uh, it will mix with the sheathing and it will form a low melting point eutectic. And this melting point, I don't remember exactly, but it's about 500 degrees 
uh, centigrade, which is a relatively low temperature for a reactor, especially if it's running out of control. So you could have a complete meltdown due to the interaction between the cladding and the uranium inside. So two of your siblings have melted down. Uh, why wouldn't you melt down? Again, that seems like a, a dishonest statement. It can melt down. The IFR, uh, however, is the only surviving liquid metal reactor in the United States. It was uh, canceled in 1994. Uh, the most interesting thing about it is they like to brag about their closed fuel cycle, uh, where they take, the, when uh, the fuel, uh, nuclear fuel gets burned up, they take it out, they can pr uh, reprocess it on site, and they use something they call pyroprocessing. The interesting thing is they call it pyroprocessing, but it's a molten salt process. They're dissolving this thing in a molten salt and they're doing electrochemistry on it. Why don't they call it molten salt? They want no association with molten salt because then it brings up another superior thing molten salt can do. Molten salt can not only be a fuel, it's a way to reprocess or process nuclear fuels and clean them up for reuse. So you call it pyroprocessing and the average person doesn't know well, okay, it's pyroprocessing, but it's molten salt. Call it what it is, be a little bit honest about it. Um, and that's actually the best feature of the IFR, is it's molten salt processing uh, technology it uses to reprocess its fuel. The sodium is problematic uh, because it's such reactive. When it goes through the core, it uh, cools these rods, takes the heat away, but if it leaks, uh, but while it's doing that, it's getting irradiated with neutrons. It becomes a radioactive form of sodium with a half-life of about 19 hours. That short half-life means you're going to get a lot of radiation out of this thing. And the worst thing is this radiation is a very high energy gamma. This high energy gamma is very penetrating. It goes through anything. So you don't want to be exposed to that because it is very deadly. So if the thing starts going out of control or you have a leak of this stuff, the sodium will, if it goes into air, it will burn. If it goes into water, it will burn. It will, and its ash will be uh, sodium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide is the active ingredient in Drano. It's lye. So you have this radioactive dra vaporized Drano from a hot fire that you can't fight with water. So you might try a carbon dioxide extinguisher, which is another common way to put out a fire. But, oh, you can't use carbon dioxide either because the uh, sodium reacts with carbon dioxide and releases more energy. So this, this is really becomes a big disaster. And this is, the, uh, this is not a theoretical thing. This fire happened in the secondary circuit, fortunately for the Japanese, uh, of their reactor called Manju. Uh, Manju was shut down for about 10 years because of this uh, sodium, fi uh, sodium fire they had in their secondary circuit. So sodium fires are actually very common events in these liquid metal fast reactors. I'll get you a side shot and maybe talk about uh, whether you'd want to have one in your neighborhood. <laughs> I'm, I'm very pro-nuclear. I think we've got to do it. There's no other energy source that we can have for 24-7 non-carbon uh, uh, energy. The, it has issues. You've got to be careful. It's a genie that gives you great stuff, but you do not want to make a mistake. However, even when we do, they tend not to be as bad as the public thinks. However, me, if uh, a molten salt... So it's right. You're doing great. Okay. Restate that you have to be careful. Oh. Okay. Okay, you ha uh, but nuclear is, again, gives you great energy, 2.8 million times more than coal, but you have to be careful with this. Um, it's, it's not something that is very tolerant of mistakes. However, when mistakes do happen, it's not as bad as people say or think. Uh, however, the IFR is such a likely disaster, and it can, because it's a fast reactor, it, it can have an accident that's much worse even than a Chernobyl with a much higher energy release. I would become, a, I'm a very pro-nuclear person, we've got to do it, but I would become a staunch anti-nuke if an IFR type reactor, a liquid metal fast reactor, were going in my neighborhood. I would, I would be a, a staunch NIMBYite then, not in my neighborhood. 
how you got into nuclear power at all. Or um, talk about your your friends when you talk to your friends about nuclear and they talk back about renewables. What did their conversations go oh. like? Uh, oh, okay. okay. We'll get even. All right. Uh, you know, they, there's this um, almost animosity between nuclear people and, and um, renewable people. And I, I, I don't share that animosity. I, the reason is, Renewable people and I have the same goal. We know we can't keep doing what we're doing. We know we can't burn the quantities of coal we do. We and the Chinese and even the Germans, we know that just cannot exi continue to exist. Um, it, it, we need to do something different. And so we're, we're really kindred spirits. Um, most renewable people though are often not very technical uh, and, and they don't understand nuclear. Uh, I'm not against them, and I've lived in Kansas, I sail in the Caribbean. In the Caribbean you have 20 knot winds, almost 24-7, high mountain peaks. I see wind energy as a viable solution there. They make their water with reverse osmosis, that's an electricity uh, uh, intensive process. It should be, they're doing, they burn diesel right now to get their electricity. They need wind energy and it would work for them. But I live in Washington DC area. In the summertime when we need air conditioning, we need uh, uh, our cooling because it's so hot and humid, the swamp on the Potomac is, uh, we, there's no wind. I sail the Chesapeake and the worst time to sail is in the summer because there's no wind. Well, if you have a wind turbine near Washington DC, that's the calmest time when we need the most power. So. I don't really see how wind would work in our geography. And that brings up to me one of the biggest problems of, of uh, renewables is it's a geographically limited thing. Like my son lives in Tucson and they should have solar panels everywhere there. Even if they were broken, the people in Tucson would be so thankful for the shade. Um, but there's so much sun energy there, that's where you should have it. My wife and I recently did a Eurail two years ago, and we used to live in Germany for five years. Uh, going through the German countryside, walking around, uh, walking around, I saw more solar cells probably in a day than I've ever seen in Arizona. Why are we building solar cells in the cloudiest place on Earth, or at least the cloudiest place I've lived in, when we don't build them in Tucson? So we need to do the geography right the conditions right for renewables. Nuclear can be done anywhere, anytime. It operates 24-7. It pushes submarines around. This is not Jules Verne science fiction. This is real. So nuclear is a very flexible uh, power source. Is it gonna be the number one power source? The only power source? No, I, that's zealotry. I've lived in Kansas. I can picture windmills, wind turbines being in uh, Kansas. Uh, I've lived in DC. I can't see that being a good market for wind energy because our greatest demand is when we have the least wind. I don't think we should be building solar cells in Germany because it's cloudy and you're at the same latitude as Montreal, Canada. Uh, it needs to be done right. We need to start thinking intelligently, but I don't go around attacking wind advocates, solar advocates. I'm a sailor. When I'm sailing, I'm a wind user. And I'm getting a heck of a lot of power, about 50 horsepower from my sails. This is a lot of energy for, well, free, if you can count having a sailboat free. But there's a lot of power there. We have a solar panel on our sailboat. We have a wind turbine to produce our electricity. It makes sense on a sailboat. It makes sense in the Caribbean where you have trade winds. It doesn't make sense to me in DC and a lot of other locations. It has to be done intelligently and then I think it will be very economic. Uh, to fill in the gap for non-fossil uh, use, nuclear is the only non-CO2 emitting 24-7 power supply we have. If you don't like that, I'm sorry, that's reality. That's what you have to deal with. Uh, we need to start living in reality and designing for our conditions, for our needs, versus what we ideologically think. We've got to start ditching these ideological explanations. Go back to our roots as being the rational country. We, our two founding fathers, uh, 
Jefferson and um, Franklin were both renowned scientists. They were not irrational nuts. They weren't ideologues. They were practical, rational people. As Americans, this is what we need to do. We need to do it with energy. We need to do it with everything, but energy is probably the place we would, should do it the most. Because basically, we've got to rip out all of our fossil fuel, and that's a big infrastructure. We've got to rip it out and replace it. The good news is, the average age of a coal plant was designed to be 30 years. I recently saw a graph, the average age of our coal plants is 40. So they're ripe for the picking. We need to retire them, we need to repower them, we need to stop burning coal, and we need to help China do the same. Again, China is not our enemy. They have needs. They have, there's no need we need to be adversaries. If we want to have a molten salt arms race to produce the best molten salt reactor, well, us humans, we've done stupider things. This would be finally a smart thing to do. So let's do a competition in molten salt. Let's start building these things. Let's get, in, get back into that game. Start building even light water reactor plants. They're still good sources of power. Plus, I want your spent fuel. It's a resource to me, a waste to you. Uh, build them. Let, we can Wind energy and I... We're in complete agreement we need to get rid of coal. Wind energy, I think you need to learn a little bit about my nuclear, and us nuclear people need to learn a little bit more about your solar and wind. It is not a dumb idea, it just needs to be done in the right location for the right people, for the right place, the right time. Oh, that was awesome. Okay, that, this is perfect. Thanks, I'm going to synchronize the audio.